everybody to this uh, city planning meeting. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the land of the Muanina people and pay respects to uh, the custodians and um, Aboriginal people uh, and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'd like also to welcome the committee. We have, I think, a full compliment. We have uh, Councillor uh, Alderman Briscoe, Councillor Harvey, uh, Alderman Barakas, Councillor Dutta, I think, and Councillor Coates. Welcome, everybody. And just to remind people that this is being live streamed and when, when you're not um, talking, if you could mute your... Um, your uh, microphone, thank you. Um, right, so um, so no no apologies nor leave of absence. Uh, we don't have anybody to can go up. Can I have somebody uh, move the minutes, please? Thank you, Alderman Barakas. Uh, any discussion? If not, um, is there any dissent to those being passed. No dissent. I'll um, move that. Oh, oh sorry, I'll make <laughs> I'll pass the, the meeting the, the minutes have been uh, moved. Item three uh, consideration of supplementary items. I don't think we have any. Item four is indications of pecuniary and conflicts of interest. Are there any conflicts or pecuniary interests? Item five is transfer of agenda items. We've got um, just a, a couple of deputations tonight. Um, and so hopefully we can move through the planning items fairly quickly because we have some, some considerable uh, reports um, uh, before us tonight. Uh, so if there's no transfer, um, item six is planning authority items, considerations of items with deputations. Can I have somebody move that, please? Thank you, Councillor Harvey. There's no dissent. We'll move on to item seven, committee acting as a planning authority. And we'll go to item 7.2.1, which is 26 Newdigate Street, North Hobart, partial demolition alterations and extension. And we have the applicant, uh, Mr. David Campbell, who, Sorry, I just have to change my view here so I can see everybody. Hello, Mr. Campbell. Mr. Campbell, you have uh, five minutes to address the committee and uh, we'll ask you any questions that we might have. So I'll hand it over to you for the five minutes. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Did, did uh, Just checking that everyone's got that uh, PDF that I sent around this afternoon. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, great. Thank you for letting me speak today. Um, obviously, I'm speaking about the property at 26 Newdigate Street. Um, I've read through the Heritage Report, and I would love to go through and answer every single question, but I've only got five minutes, so I'm going to kind of speak to them larger in a, in a kind of more general sense. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to say that my partner and I are huge supporters of Heritage Values. We bought this house precisely because of the Heritage Values that it has. Um, and when we engage our architects, the first thing we said to them is, don't touch the house. Um, we love it. Um, we love the trees. We love the heritage uh, look. We love the character. Um, we chose the architects because their work, um, they've done quite a few extensions around Hobart um, and thought the work is complementary and sympathetic to what previously had been there. And we think that their design for our house has done this. Um, the house as it stands currently is a bit of a mishmash. Um, it was originally included on the heritage register because it quote, uh, because, quote, it demonstrated the characteristics of a single story Georgian house. But over the years, numerous changes have been made to the house by different owners, um, including changing it to a two story house. Um, much of the back of the house is new. It's got a bad non heritage kitchen. It's got a bad non heritage bathroom. And these are the problems we're trying to fix. Uh, so here are the major concerns I could touch on in the, in the few short minutes. Um, the report raised concerns about the form, um, but our extension take its lead from the original building. It follows its lines, its footprints. The original building has determined the placement of literally everything we've done in the extension. We're keeping the floor lower than we wanted so the old floorboards can butt up beautifully against the new concrete. 
Um, on the roof, we made the roof turn where the original building turns, and so it moves its weight and scale up and out to the rear of the building. And all the brakes in the sections take their lead from where the current building changes, where the old stops and the new starts is always determined by the old. The old building had some symmetry, but as the original heritage registry points out, there are unusual asymmetric aspects to the building. It notes the weirdness of the unbalanced shape of the front veranda, um, which we mirrored at the back. The larger, heavier shape in the front is mirrored by the larger shape at the back. No concerns about the fenestration, but the truth is the majority of the windows in the building aren't original. There are seven heritage windows in the building, all of which we're planning to keep. And there's eight more recent additions. All the ones we're looking to replace are the ones at the back of the house, most of which were added, I'm assuming, in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. Um, we're only looking at adding one forward-facing one, and this has taken its lead from the existing building. Um, it's placed uh, to fit around the existing chimney. Um, and the main, one of the main concerns for us is trying to make this house environmentally friendly. We've, the, we've got a large window facing north, so we can take the advantage of the path to solar to help with heating and lighting costs. Um, the report raised concerns about the scale of the house. Um, when we originally met with the heritage officer, she was worried about the roof height, so we dropped it down. And so now the scale is subservient as requested. As I said earlier, this line is determined by the original and scaled appropriately. The original building is 109 square meters and the new section adds 48, so it's less than half of the original size. Um, I think in the PDF, I don't know if I can share this, but the PDF I sent to everyone today shows more accurately how that view looks from the street. Um, there was concern raised around the bulk. The bulk is as close as true, it's how we fit in our larger family, but it's hidden away, it's no loss to the public, it's at no loss to the trees in our backyard, and it's uh, no loss to our wonderful backyard. The work at the ground floor is concealed by a pre-existing gate, and the vast majority of work on the second level is concealed by a current roof line. There's concerns about sitting, as, as you can see from the diagrams, it sits well back from the street. And the final concerns around materials and colors and finishes. Um, we you are using contemporary materials. The heritage guidelines specifically state that any new fabric must be readily identifiable as such. So our colors and finishes, like we didn't want to do a, a black box. Um, so we're planning to redo the, the roof at the front of the house and galvanize steel in the original colors. And the new walls are being done in untreated wood, which should fade to a natural gray and blend in with the colors of the trees behind to make it as unobtrusive as possible. Um, there was concerns about the shape of the roof. Um, now, our current second story bedroom is very small. I'm actually in it right now. You can see that I keep bumping my head. Um, I can only stand up in the center of two meters of my upstairs room at the moment. Um, if we were to continue the line as it is, I would have an extension that also only allows me to stand up in the central two meters, which would be an unfunctional house. <laughs> Sorry? Sorry, it's somebody. You just um, have, um, if you can finish up, you've got about 30 seconds to go. Thank you. Okay, yeah. And the, well, the other option is we could raise the roof in the same line, but that gives us an apex of eight meters, which is far too tall, obviously, it's a ridiculous kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, look, we've moved in as a family. We, okay. Uh, another 30 seconds. Okay. So, we moved in as a family and we've grown, grown to love the area. Um, but we live on a street that has heritage houses and we're proud to be the custodian of one of them. But the reality is we can't uh, not. No, man, the house has gotten too small for our family um, and we're not trying to build a fake heritage building. We're not creating a prestige of an old, old style. Which they tend to look a bit weird. We're trying to build an extension that complements and supports what's there already, which I believe we're doing. Um, and the reality is if we kind of send this house, we bought this house when there's three of us with our first child and with our second child, it's just too small. Um, and if we can't extend, we're, we're going to have to move out. Um, over the last few years, every house that's been sold in our street has been turned into an Airbnb property. There are five of them within a throwing distance of this house. Um, and I kind of believe, I like the idea of thinking heritage as being something that supports the residents uh, if all the residents have left. Okay, Thank, thanks Mr. Campbell. I will, um, I'll open it to, to questions now and um, you might be able to, to fill in the gaps where, where you couldn't finish. Um, yeah, great. So we'll start with you, Alderman Barakas. Um, Thank you, and um, thanks, David. Uh, just, sorry, just just before we start, Councillor Harvey, do you mind turning on your camera, please? Thanks, Chair, um, and and through you, Chair. Thank, thanks, Mr. Campbell. Just something I heard you say. I just wanted to just confirm, so I've got a clear picture. The um, dimensions and style of the roofing and the and the the structure at the back was that done 
um, to try and reduce the visibility from the street and the the, the mass of it? Because that's 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 what I sort of heard you say. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding what you said properly. Like if you, if you had it more square or more symmetrical, then it would have been much bigger. Is that what you, is that effectively what you were saying? That's correct. Yes. Originally we had a higher so we could get more of the sun in. And after meeting with the heritage officer, we did bring that line down. So now it does, it's got a skillion roof. So the line is the same line of the roof as it was. And it goes back, but it goes back and up. So from the street, you know, from any level where anyone can stand, it has dropped. So it is about reducing the scale. Um, we're a bit of a weird property. We're jammed up to the side like they used to be able to do. So if we, we can't go symmetrical because then we're, you know, we're, our, our side wall is literally the side fence, which yeah. you can't do these days, but you could do in the 1890s. Yeah. So, so effectively, after consultation with heritage staff, you've done this to try and reduce the impact on the property. Absolutely, yes. yes. Other questions? Uh, so I have a question. Just um, So there has been considerable discussion with the heritage officers in relation to, to what's uh, appropriate um, uh, given the situation and you know the the design principles of the heritage building so um, we've certainly got that in in the report um you're saying that there's absolutely no way that you can you can um fulfill any of those criteria uh, we we have discussed this with them we're, we're quite jammed in where we are if we were go back further we'd hit a there's a magnificent tree in the backyard and that would hit the roots and so that would not be able to um, be done. Like, you know, we'd kill off a, a tree that we're not allowed to believe is protected or if it isn't, it should be. Um, we looked at a lot of different ways of actually giving us the kind of space we require um, because we're jammed up against the fence line. It makes it difficult to go that way. Um, we can't go directly out. Um, like I was explained with the roof, we can't match the roof line without having a non-usable second story. Um, so look, I think we spent a lot of time with the architects and then after meeting with the heritage officer of playing around and trying to find this to fit into this unusual space. Um, and I think this is, is the only one that really kind of gives us, you know, if we, we could, we look at an option where we didn't have another bedroom and then, you know, then my kids are still stuck in one bedroom together. Um, um, you know, the minimum requirements we needed was those, you know, this is as small as we may able to get it um, and still meet the brief. Thank you. Further questions? If not, um, thank you, Mr. Campbell. Um, I'll now open it to the, to the committee um, uh, to discuss this, this item. Thank you. Mr. Campbell, if you can turn off your microphone, thanks. Oh, sure. Committee. Chair. Councillor Harvey. Look, these these are always really tricky um, developments. Trying to put an extension on a, onto a heritage house and get it approved um, is a challenge. Um, but I'm also mindful that over time Hobart changes; it needs to change to meet the meet modern needs. But I'm also aware that there's opportunities for thinking differently about these sorts of developments. And I'm sympathetic to the developer, but I'm also sympathetic to the, the heritage officer uh, who's recommended refusal. Um, but I, and I don't know what solution I can offer, but I've got to either decide whether I support the proponent or and overturn the council recommendation or support the heritage officer. Um, and I lean towards the heritage officer because I, I, I understand that that's their profession and they're representing the streetscape and they're representing the planning scheme. Uh, tricky situation to be in, but tonight I'm gonna to land with the, the heritage officer and I hope that an alternative can, can come forward here. Um, but I, and I, I can't offer any solution for that, but I'm hoping it can be re-evaluated re and come back with something that does get through the heritage officer and the, the planning scheme. So my, my um, suggestion would be to, spend a bit more time with the heritage officer and see if there's some way of compromising so that this does get a recommendation for approval. But tonight I'll support the officer's recommendation. That's unfortunate for the proponent, but um, I'll go with the recommendation for refusal and hopefully this will come back to us with something that's 
um, easier to approve for the heritage so, officer. So I take it that, that you've moved. I'll the, move the item. Thank you, Councillor I'm open Harvey. to the, Yeah, I think there'll be a split and, decision tonight, but I'll start, I've started the debate. Thank you. And uh, we'll go to Councillor Coates, then Alderman Briscoe. Um, thank you, Chair. Look, um, uh, look, much like Bill Harvey, uh, or sorry, Councillor Harvey, um, I, I told him torn, but I think, you know, um, we've heard that the applicant has actually made changes in response to the heritage officers. To, so to me, that is them trying to sort of meet them halfway, if you like. Um, obviously, the big concern is the view from the street angle. Um, we've heard that it was it was lowered from what they originally wanted. We've also heard um, in the deputation that um, they've actually deliberately gone with material, the timber and untreated. So, so, you know, we'll hopefully look very similar, if not the same. Um, so, you know, to my mind, um, there's a reason that we as representatives of the community sit, um, you know, in, in as a planning authority rather than a, a, a professional heritage officers or rather than professional uh, town planners. Ultimately, it's so we can gather advice. And we do have some advice from the heritage officer and it's quite strong. Um, and look, I, I, I think it's, it's good and I thank them for that. Um, but, you know, ultimately, we're here to make a decision for what's best for the community um, and, and to look at at what the facts are in this case. And I've heard evidence tonight that um, this applicant has done the right thing. Um, they've made deliberate changes to what they wanted. They're not getting what they wanted originally. Um, they've, they've tried to be constructive along the way, but they've hit a point where they've said, well, you know, this is my genuine best effort. Um, and I heard at least, you know, and the evidence before me, significant change. And then I've got to sort of ask myself, well, what is the community interest here? Um, you know, we're representatives of the community. Um, we're not just a panel of heritage experts. If, if that was the best solution, that's what would be set up as. Um, and look, you know, we don't have people tonight representing against this. Um, as I look at it, I think this is something that fits in. I mean, we heard that this area is turning into an Airbnb uh, precinct. Here's someone who actually wants to update um, what is a heritage building to make it modern living standards livable. And they're doing it in such a way and they've made compromises so that it retains the character and, and fits in nicely. So look, as far as I see it, um, I appreciate the advice we've been given, um, but you know, I think it is a bit of a win for the community. Um, it is a bit of a win for the applicant, sure. But I think it actually is a bit of a win for the heritage. Um, you know, ultimately, the design and the changes that the applicant made in response to the heritage concerns um, are such that, that I think the heritage values will be kept. Um, and ultimately, that's, you know, to me, that's a win-win-win. So, um, look, I will be um, not going with the officer's advice and I'll foreshadow a motion for approval. Uh, I think in this instance, we've got a scenario where ultimately this residents will need to be updated to modern standards um, to fit modern families. Um, and I think we've got a proposal in front of us that does that, um, where we've got an applicant who, um, by all the evidence, has gone out of their way to make significant changes um, to try and achieve a win on that line. Um, and I think we as a community should meet them halfway. So Thank you. Thank you, Councillor yep. Coates. Now, um, before I go to Alderman Briscoe, just to let you know that Ms White, the Heritage Officer, is here if anybody has any questions of her. So Alderman Briscoe, then Councillor Dutton, then Alderman Barakas. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, look, uh, uh, Councillor Harvey did outline the dilemma that we always have. Um, in this case, I think the evidence that Mr Campbell has presented to us today, where if, for example, if he continued a, an extension that with the current bridge line, he'd be in the same situation he is now, uh, bumping his head against the side of the of the uh, the walls there, so or the the roof. Um, to me, to me, um, whilst it is a strong heritage report against it, I, I think as um, Councillor Coates said, we're we're here to make sure that the buildings that are built today will last another hundred years or hundred odd years. Um, to me, it is an aesthetic judgment, and I can't see anything wrong with it. There are far more. Um, obtrusive extensions, even in places like Battery Point, um, yet uh, yet they managed to get approval. So all I can say, oh, we, uh, the comments that uh, Councillor Coates made, I would have made very similar ones, and uh, and I will support the foreshadowed motion for approval. Thanks, Alderman Briscoe. Councillor Data. Thank you, Chair. I just have a question: um, Is it possible to defer this uh, or not? Uh, when do we need to decide it by uh, Mr. Banks? 
31st of October. Oh, no, sorry, that's the wrong one. October, Chair. Sorry, say that again. 25th of October. So that would be, um, yeah, so be next uh, next uh, Monday that we'd have to make the decision. So we today, Councillor Dutta, we're making a recommendation from this committee to, to full council. Th th thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, like uh, the others, I find myself in a dilemma as well. It is not an easy decision, but as uh, usual, I am guided by the rules. Um, and when I look at the rules, I have difficulty uh, with a number of clauses that it does not satisfy. Now, uh, I take on board the fact that there are no objections as it were, but I don't use that as a criteria to make my decision. I uh, also take into account uh, the fact that uh, I am no expert in this area, but I rely on the expert advice. And sometimes my interpretation can differ. And in this instance, I tried my best to look at the clauses and match it with the facts. Like any uh, law we do, you take the facts and look at the rules and see how you can interpret it. And I have difficulty interpret, interpreting in any other way. And hence, I was um, uh, looking forward if there was a possibility of deferring it so I can go physically to have a look at it, that's all. But in the meantime, I am now in a position where having looked at the rules, the criteria, the provisions of the um, uh, acceptable solution, it has failed, the performance criteria, uh, and therefore I will have difficulty supporting it. Thanks. It doesn't mean that I won't take a deferral, um, a motion for deferral, but I might hear from Alderman Barakas first. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, um, I appreciate the difficulties, as Councillor Harvey said, and I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with some of the difficulties. Um, I would disagree with some of the, I suppose, interpretations. I think, um, you know, once again, noting that you know, when we have these sort of touchy or... Um, or difficult to assess applications. This is where our role as elected representatives exercising our discretion comes into play. And I'll note that importantly, there was no representations against this. In fact, there were two representations in favour of this supporting it. One of one of which I think was an immediate neighbour um, uh, saying that they were they were well in favour of it. Um, also, just in regards to the PDF that we were sent today. The, the first slide on that, I think, tells, tells the bigger story. It shows how visible the proposed um, addition would be from the, from the streetscape, which is ultimately what this whole discussion is about, um, is the impact that the, um, that the extension will have on the pre-existing building as, as visible from the street. Um, and look, I, I understand that we have a, a, you know, the heritage precinct provisions are in place to try and preserve a sense of heritage place um, and all that. But when something, you know, I do sometimes get some difficulties in, in reading some of the heritage advice because it, it seems to me that, um, and it's happened time and again, that whether something, whether an addition to a building is visible as much as someone can see 30 centimetres of the the building behind the pre-existing heritage building or whether they can see 30 metres behind the um, pre-existing building seems to make no difference. So long as the building's visible from behind, then it's deemed to be dominant and unreasonably changing the streetscape. And I'm not, I'm not sure that's a um, interpretation that I feel comfortable with. I think there, there needs to be a, a sense of discretion there. Um, I think the way that this is designed, and as was noted during questioning, that the shape of this building was was as so to try and minimise the impact that it would have on the street as much as as much as possible after consultation with with um, heritage staff. So, look, I, I think if you actually look at those renderings, look at how the look at how the extension is positioned on the site, um, it does clearly keep keep the primacy of the pre existing heritage building from, from the streetscape. The first thing you see is a streetscape, and while you can see the existing building, it is pretty clearly subservient to the, to the existing building. That's the first thing you see. It's the most obvious thing you see. 
Um, and it is pretty clear that the extension is tucked away behind. And whilst it might be visible, it, it certainly doesn't, in my view, um, dominate or unreasonably detract from the existing site. Um, and there, there, there is the other thing that the, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about wanting to make sure that any additions to um, heritage buildings are seen as being different and not attempting to mirror or emulate pre-existing heritage. Um, but as soon as they try and do something that falls in line with that rule, they're also then breaching the other rule that says that it's not in keeping with the pre-existing heritage building. So as far as my read on this, I see something that has the, the support of the local community. I, I see something that has gone out of its way to make sure that it is um, respecting the, the important and heritage part of the building and retaining the primacy of that original heritage um, and it's doing as much as it can to um, be sensitive to that. So, look, I'm, I'm uh, by my interpretation of what's being put forward and my interpretation of the, the scheme that we have in front of us, I'm very comfortable supporting the foreshadowed motion that Councillor Coates had and if uh, Councillor Coates hadn't put that, I would have been putting something similar. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Barakas. Um, Ms Wade, I have a, a couple of questions for you. Um, just in relation to uh, the, um, the impact from the streetscape, is that an important component of, of the consideration today? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, the precinct statements actually refer specifically to the uh, integrity and the impressive streetscape certainly the consistency of the single storey uh, weatherboard facades and the uniformity of form and scale. So it does reflect a distinctive uh, 19th century streetscape. Uh, so in my assessment, this, this application was really going to change that because of the degree of visibility um, when viewed from the, the photos uh, from each side of the building. And, and that's evidence in my report with the two photos that are taken from the street. And uh, secondly, the, the you know, with, with planning and applications such as this, there's uh, quite often a lot of to and fro. What, um, um, do, you, do you feel that there has been some ground made uh, in relation to this application from, from its original um, application? Uh, well, to be honest, no, I don't think so. Um, the roof has been lowered by uh, 200 millimetres. That's the maximum uh, roof height. That's the RL that is shown in the drawings. It was lowered by 200. There was some alterations to the fenestration pattern on the northeast elevation, um, but uh, that's uh, and there, and also some changes to the way the roof will present um, from the street. That's Newdigate Street. Um, so the when the application first came, we uh, council officers alerted the applicant to some um, problems with the potential design and we had that meeting and um, then this proposal came in. So I don't feel that it does go far enough to satisfy the provisions of the scheme. And the, the question about asymmetry, um, can you just uh, respond to, to that from the applicant's suggestion of, of the asymmetry of the, the original building? Uh, so, uh, so in my assessment, the uh, I understand what you mean. There is a, uh, I think the applicant might have been referring to the statement of significance within the data sheet from the Tasmanian Heritage Register. Um, the place is not registered with the Tasmanian Heritage Register uh, and the Heritage Council. So that is essentially not um, a relevant consideration, um, but it does have a slightly asymmetrical um, a veranda. It is perhaps a veranda that was truncated at some point, or it was only added on in part. Um, I guess I can't answer that, but it is a symmetrical uh, 
typical symmetrical Victorian Georgian cottage with a central front door, windows either side, uh, the typical symmetrical uh, roof form, and it does have two chimneys on either side, one close to the street and the other one slightly set back further, but they're, again, they're both similar heights. Um, so there is a fair degree of symmetric, symmetry to the building as it is already. Thank you. Um, Mr. Noy, I've just got a question for you, just in relation to obviously the part of this proposal and its height, uh, you know, the, the positioning uh, at the back of, of the house um, allows for that uh, backyard, backyard space. Do we consider that as part of um, this type of application, the public, the, the private open space? Um, yeah, yes, we certainly do, but um, I think um, uh, in this instance, the only issue um, uh, currently of uh, concern with this application based on the officer's assessment is that that um, heritage, those heritage provisions. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dutta, did you have other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Chi. I just wanted to uh, uh, put forward the procedural motion that we defer this. Uh, I'll, if there's no further comment, I'll I'll put the um, the. I, I needed to ask some more questions. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. I didn't sorry. Have yep. hand up and I waved around and. Uh, oh yeah, I see it now. My right, apologies. No, thank you. It's, it's my Zoom vision. Go ahead, Alderman Briscoe, before I. Perhaps uh, uh, Councillor Dutta occupies more screen space than I do, so you see him better. Um, uh, while Miss waits on the, on um, online in front of perhaps somewhere else in Tasmania than other than we are, but uh, lovely background there. Um, what weight would Miss Wade put on um, uh, the street in itself? Opposite there is a, a 1960s. It looks like a 1960s block of flats. On the same side of the street there are. Um, a big uh, uh, car park that goes on to another block of flats. So where do, what weight does she give to, or Miss Waite, what weight do you give to? Um, it, it's not a pristine uh, Victorian um, workman's cottage. It's, it, it's interspersed with, it seems to me, a little bit further down the, the road and also these two blocks of flats and presumably others as well that in my quick uh, Zoom, uh, oh, sorry, Google Earth tour of uh, the area, uh, identify those two blocks of flats. This way. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, the other side of the road is not in uh, the same, it isn't in a heritage precinct. Uh, it is only this side of the street that's in the West Hobart One Heritage Precinct. Uh, but there's also a block of flats on the same side as this development uh, with a car park in front of it, it appears. Uh, that's correct. I think you uh, are presumably referring to 28A Newdigate yeah, Street. Um, yes, that is a block of flats from, uh, I think, the 1960s or 70s. Uh, and uh, it's not, it is within the precinct. Uh, as with any heritage precinct, there will always be uh, elements that are perhaps not complete and adding to the uh, and contribute to the significance. Um, but it isn't a heritage listed site as opposed to uh, the majority of uh, buildings on this side of the street, which are individually heritage listed as well. Um, I just I wonder if I could just press you a little bit further, Ms. Wade. What weight would you give? I think we had a, a sort of similar case in Newtown, maybe a year or so ago, where uh, almost all the houses were uh, uh, had uh, additions or, or there were new buildings. Yet you, you, we still, in the end, approved a, a development, uh, um, an extension, in the back of the house. So I, I'm just wondering what what weight you do give to when it is not a pristine. Um, area as you've described it. I, um, I, I don't think you quite answered that question. I'm sorry. Ms. Waite. Through you, Chair. Um, so in terms of the, 
the listings, it is a heritage listed building itself. Um, there are heritage buildings, listed buildings uh, on either side and further along. So there is quite a group of them. So that in itself indicates the high degree of uh, heritage value uh, of individual buildings, but also uh, the fact that it is within a heritage precinct. So I, I do look at what is also heritage listed in the same street, and there are quite a number of heritage listed buildings. Thank you. Further questions? Uh, Councillor Dutta. Just one question through you, Chair. Now, if this was to go to appeal, will we be able, will we be able to defend this through you, Chair? As refusal or approval? As, as a refusal. Ms. White or Mr. Noy? Mr. Noy? Yes, um, Chair, look, yes, we would be able to defend um, the officer's recommendation in this instance. Thank you. Councillor Coates, and then we'll wrap it up, I think. Oh, I've got a question. Uh, uh, a similar question for you to the director. If we were to approve this tonight, um, would we need to defend it in the appeal? In any appeal? Mr. Noy? Uh, well, it would be dependent on whether there's any an appeal. Um, uh, if there wasn't an appeal, then we wouldn't have to defend it, Chair. Good. No. Councillor Harvey? Um, just following up on um, Councillor Dutter's proposed deferral motion, do we need um, authorization or do we need approval from the proponent, Mr. Campbell? Um, we would need an extension of time, yes. I imagine. No, Mr. Noy. Uh, no, well, we'd have to have a, a special before council on the 25th, um, and we'd probably need to uh, have some guidance as to uh, what the purpose of the deferral uh, was mm. for. Um, are you seeking uh, uh, officers to uh, discuss with the applicant a, um, changes to the proposal, um, you know, what are the nature of the changes that you're seeking? As the data. Thank you, Chair. That was the reason, you know, if there was going to be an opportunity for discussion with the applicant. Oh, uh, Alden Briscoe, um, you want to ask another question? Uh, a, a comment, yes, a comment. Uh, 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 Councillor Dutter has changed his reasons for a deferral because he wanted to go out there. He can always go out there if the decision is the following week. Uh, just a, a further question of uh, um, uh, Mr Noy. Uh, is, uh, the, as the two representatives that were in favour of it, it is, would you agree that it would be, unless the, um, the applicant was unhappy with the conditions if, of, of approval, it would be very unlikely that there would be any um, appeal to our council decision if we approve it. Would that be the case? Mr Noy? Uh, yes, Chair. That, um, uh, Alderman Briscoe is correct. Right. OK. Now, I'm going to um, uh, put the uh, Councillor Dutta's motion for, for um, deferral to a special meeting uh, before council. Can uh, those who are in favour please raise their hands? Those against? That's just for you, Chair. Okay, thank you. So um, we, we now have the motion as moved by Councillor Harvey for refusal. Uh, those in favour? And those against? The motion yes. is lost, so we go... Oh, sorry, Dave. Um, yes, sorry, yes. So, um, Councillor Coates, what are your reasons for approval? Uh, I believe the director through you has um, conditions for approval. Mr Noy? Um, yes, Miss um, Aby, I believe, um, has them, so she can forward those on. Um, so I, I take it that uh, Council uh, believes it satisfies the heritage provisions of the uh, code under the planning scheme, Chair. 
Uh, yes, conditions um, or proposed conditions have been circulated earlier today. Um, Craig, I wonder if you could put those on the screen, please. So essentially there's um, heritage and uh, I, look, I can't read it all. Perhaps, perhaps Ms. Avey, could you just, um, could you just uh, point out the main, main reasons if, if that's not too difficult? Uh, they're mostly fairly standard conditions. The first one is incorporating the application documents, um, standard stormwater connection conditions, uh, protection of infrastructure and um, protection of uh, soil and water management. If you could go into the next screen, please, Craig. And there's a heritage condition relating to the colours materials, which again is the fairly standard condition for this sort of proposal. Thank you very much. Um, is there any discussion? Alderman Briscoe, have you got your hand up? I may have that yellow. I'm just trying to work out how to get rid of it. I'll lower my hand. Yeah, there it oh, is. I'll, I'll, I'll be coming to you for, for um, questions all the time. So um, I just might make a comment. Look, I um, do appreciate the heritage considerations, obviously, um, and take note that, that there are a, a number of things that probably should have been uh, dealt with. Um, we've also heard from the applicant that this has been um, to, to, to make sure that the, the site works effectively for them. It has been difficult to, to do that, to, to um, meet all those heritage requirements. I'm pleased that there is a um, heritage uh, condition in relation to the, to the pallet, um, because I think that could probably um, um, modify the impact from the street. Um, and I'm also just um, just want to make sure that we do have um, those uh, elements of the backyard and the public open space, uh, the private open space, sorry, um, that the trees are maintained. Can we have that as advice? Um, I know that Mr. Campbell is probably going to do that, but can we add that as advice, please? Uh, I don't see a problem with that, Chair. You happy with that, Councillor Coates? I look happy to do that and um, noting, of course, that in the deputation, um, the applicant obviously said that one of the reasons they didn't want to go further back out was because of the roots of a tree. So I think it's eminently sensible and in line with what the applicant's already said. Thank you. Further discussion? No further discussion, then I'll put the motion for approval subject to those conditions. Uh, those um, who are in favour, raise your hands. Uh, against. So the motion is carried for two and that will go to full council for consideration next Monday. Thanks, Mr. Campbell. Now the next um, item is 7.2.3, which is uh, 290 to 296 Argyle Street. And we have uh, the representor, Mr. Mark Drury, and the applicant, or acting for the applicant, Mr. Fraser Reed. So, have we got Mr. Drury, Drury there? Mr. Reed. Hi, Chair. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mark. I couldn't see you. <laughs> Looking at a, I'm looking at Alderman Briscoe. <laughs> uh, all right, so you have five minutes to address the committee with your concerns, Mr. Drury. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks for your time. Um, I've made a, a quite a uh, lengthy written submission, which I've submitted to Council during the representation period, which I believe um, all Aldermen have read. Um, I'll only briefly go through, it's only got five minutes, and probably just as part of an introduction, on the architect that um, was involved with the Batch House Apartments, the conversion of an existing light industry building 
um, there where we successfully applied for and was granted planning um, a a rezoning to residential and um, that site is now home to 12 very successful and highly sought after residential apartments. My interest in this application um, is purely on the wellbeing um, and the amenity of the residents that are now occupying the batch house apartments. Um, I appreciate that this site next door has been previously used as a car yard. However, this was vacated over two years ago. And I, um, my opinion is that the new use intensifies the, um, the use that that um, site previously had. Probably my um, biggest concerns was um, a number of items that I believe should have been included in the um, application, which weren't. And if I just go through these quickly, and just give you some points on them. Um, first one is in site contamination. It was an existing service station site um, next door and as part of the application for the batch house apartments, we're required to do geotechnical um, surveys under our building because there was known leakage of fuels from that service station site underneath the batch house. We did those tests as part of our planning application. It revealed that there was fuel leakage underneath the building and part of, the, of our construction process, we had to excavate and, uh, quite a bit of material and dispose of it um, under license. So my concern is that the site we're talking about next door has got a history of site contamination and that any um, disturbance of that site um, should have had, or sorry, any application put forward should have had a site contamination report done. Um, the scheme goes to talk about um, one exemption being that if you don't dis disturb more than one square metre. Um, I think what needs to be clear is, we're not talking about one cubic metre, like in excavation, we're talking about one square metre, which is about that footprint around, if you span around on your chair, it's a very small footprint of which then would trigger the, a, a, a report that needs to be prepared. I've looked at through the documentation um, and there's a number of items on there that would clearly show that there is in excess of one square metre of disturbance of that site, even though there's been further information submitted to say otherwise. And I'd put forward that these would include the removal of the existing slab outside of the footprint of the new building that's gonna sit on top of the slab, um, excavations um, through the pavement to get the drainage off the new downpipes across through the new slab. Um, there's also works exceeding outside the slab area. And also if there's any unknown works, investigation works to be done around services which the building would be hooking into and not to mention any unknown footings that at the moment we've got in the application that there'd be no footings required despite including the um, proposed car wash being quite a large structure. Um, I would uh, submit that there would be some form of excavation. So um, would have liked to have seen that. I'm sure the neighbours would have liked to have seen it as well just from a point of view of how that site's going to be, um, um, you know, handled during um, to do with its previous history of contamination. Um, the other one is to do with um, traffic amenity. The Argyle Street is a very busy street. We again, with the batch house, had to do a traffic impact study with the additional cars coming out on onto Argyle Street. Um, we know that there's similar or less amount of cars than what's been proposed. Um, with this development to what was there with the um, um, car sales before, but anyone who rents a rent a car would know that at various peak times, whether it be collection or uh, drop off, that there is quite a bit of activity with cars moving on and off the site, um, which would, in my opinion, exceed anything that would come on and off the site to do with a used car lot. There's a used car lot further up the road. If anyone goes past that or spend some time there during the day, I think you'd agree there would not be the car movement there with a used car lot that there would be with a um, car hire place. So again, um, no submission um, with a report on a traffic um, impact study in that particular area. Um, the other one is, and probably the biggest one is to do with noise. There's a proposed car wash facility with this application that's only three metres off the ground yes. of the apartment. And the batch house apartment has slots in that side wall, which has direct access to the open courtyards of six of the apartments along that edge. There was no submissions um, with the application um, to do with the noise that, that the likely car wash would, wash would transmit. And I noticed in the officer's report that it simply um, has, has 
in, in accordance with the acceptable solution clause 24.3.2A1, the noise measured at boundary must not exceed 55 decibels between certain hours. Uh, Rory, would you like to, to finish up, please? Yep, very soon. Um, and the officer's report has simply stated that if this noise is seen to exceed these levels, then the um, people would have a chance to object to that or take further action under the Environmental Management Pollution Control Act. Uh, my submission would be that the residents or anyone in that immediate area should have had access to that um, at, the, at the time of the report. Okay, um, look, I, I'll, um, we'll probably get to, to some questions now and you might be able to add anything that you mightn't have covered. Uh, so I'll, I'll open up to the committee for questions. Questions. I certainly have questions. Um, just in relation to the operating hours, um, is there any? Uh, what's your what's your feeling about the impact on on um, batch house residents? Is that addressed to me? The question. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Jury. Um, yeah. I think that would all hinge around the potential noise that's coming from this car wash um, facility. Um, Again, I'm not a resident there, I'm the architect of the development, um, but I would foresee that if, if a machine was starting up, you know, three metres outside your window, whether um, with the noise um, concerns during certain hours, it wouldn't really matter whether it was starting at, at 7.30am or 11am, if you're outside in your courtyard and there's a, you know, a car wash, um, you know, machine rattling away at, at a loud time, I think the hours would make no difference. It's, it's really the what we're talking about is what is the potential um, noise amenity concerns with this machine, not to mention the water spray from it as well. Thank you. If there are no further questions, um, I'll thank you, Mr. Jury, and um, ask Mr. Reid and Mr. Johnston to, to respond. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, look, um, I'm we're sympathetic to um, Mr Drury's concerns and trying to um, uh, work through those and we provide a response back to council. Um, just firstly, um, it's important just to um, remember that this is a light industrial zone. It's not like a, a residential zone and the range of permitted uses in that um, in this area um, certainly include a car wash as a permitted use. So it's not as though we're going for something that's out of um, the spirit of what the zone is. Um, it's a change from the existing use rights as the, uh, um, as the car yard. Um, as part of that, there was some ancillary um, car rental uh, use from that, from that, um, that use. And I provided some information about that with the application. Um, so we, we're looking for a fairly similar use to what it's been used as. In terms of the parking generation, the key thing under the scheme is whether you're increasing the traffic by 40 vehicle movements a day. Um, that's sort of the threshold under the parking and access code. Um, and the existing um, permit for the car yard had 60 vehicles, and this is down to 32. Um, we provided some information from uh, Thrifty around what they see as the uh, likely peak use. Um, and I think they said 25 vehicles a day is sort of like their peak usage from the seasonal usage. Um, so 25 to 30, yeah, 25 to 30, they're saying. So um, um, we don't think the traffic is an issue. Um, noise, um, as I say, a car wash is a permitted use, um, but we do need to ensure that we're not going to exceed these noise limits. Um, and it kicks in when you're basically at night time when the residential amenity is a... Um, is of a greater concern. So what we're suggesting is a condition around that from um, that, that the car wash is only used between 8 a.m. and 4.30 p.m., Monday to Friday. Um, I think it's 9 to 12 on Saturdays and not on Sundays and public holidays. 
happy uh, certainly to add an additional condition around um, noise compliance of that, um, that car wash facility. Um, the other thing that probably needs to be addressed is that contem land concern that Mr Drury had, and I understand why he has that concern. Um, the way the scheme works is if you're changing it to a sensitive use, then you need to look at contamination um, and the suitability of the site, or if um, you're excavating. And as Mr Drury says, it's the one square metre um, threshold, which is not very big, we, we agree. Um, but this proposal, it's important to understand it, it's a modular building that's been put on, on the site. Um, and it's very much seen as a temporary use on this site. Um, UTAS are basically relocating this, this tenant off um, one of their other sites further down Argyle Street. Um, and for that very reason, it is a, a, a modular building that will sit on top of the slab. Um, we've taken advice from Aldermark as structural engineers, um, specifically when Mr Drury raised this concern to um, work through those things and confirm that it can be dealt with as pads on top of the slab. Um, and they have confirmed that to be the case. Um, and that if there was any voids in the slab uh, or below the slab, they said they can detect that and they can grab fill it and then and put the pads on top. So. Um, we agree that it's important that the, the site is not opened up and, um, and the concern through the planning schemes impact of workers during the construction. And we're confident we can avoid, um, avoid that issue um, after taking further advice from the structural engineer. And the services connect into the existing service locations, the down, the down pipes um, and, the, and the sewer um, and the water. So probably best to just pass it to you if there are any questions, but happy to look at some additional conditions if that if that uh, puts council at ease. Thank you. Mr Johnson, did you want to add anything? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, no, I think uh, Fraser has um, summed it up nicely, uh, but you. happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Harvey. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mr. Reid. Um, you said it's potentially a temporary site. No. I'm just a bit unsure. Like the university has owned the, the previous site and they've helped in the shift to a new site. Is that the case? And Thrifty don't intend to be there for a long time. Is that, is that what you're intimating? Yeah, yes, that's correct. Um... Yes, yeah, so the, they have an existing lease on the other site and basically five years we'll see that out. So the university are trying to um, relocate them for the, the life of their, um, the remainder of their lease. It's basically okay, right. yep, all right. So, my, so it's probably only a temporary solution or, or then the Thrifty would have to take up the lease with the current owner of the site, I guess. Um, these are demountable buildings. So I'm just thinking why wouldn't you switch them around and put the car wash on the right and the office on the left and have the car wash a bit further away from, from the residential block? I think it's to do with those services, existing service locations to the, uh, the toilet um, location um, at that other end, so it basically lines up. Um, otherwise, yeah, there might be some flexibility around that, but we... You know, we're talking about 8, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. during a weekday on a light industrial site. You know, mm -hmm. It's a pretty reasonable thing to want to do, I think, particularly when a, a full-scale car wash would be a permitted use on this site. Okay. And can you, can, can you explain the, how the car wash works? Is it a hand car wash or is it a mechanical car wash? Uh, I don't know that detail, to be honest. Matthew, are you able to... Uh, look, um, Councillor Harvey, I understand it's a, it's certainly a, a bit like the office building. It is modular and you drive into it. Um, now, my understanding, it would still have a manual operation, um, not, not a full um, robotic uh, car wash that, that you do see um, further up the road. Okay, so there'd be humans washing a car. 
Okay, so there's less noise unless they've got the radio playing loud. So it's not a mechanical noise that will be permeating the atmosphere there. No, that's right. All right. Other questions? No, thanks, Chair. Um, I've got a, a number of questions because I've by, I, I just could you just explain to me again um, this um, temporary lease arrangement um, because is a is thrifty going back to that site uh, that the university has uh, presumably on the corner of what's that Op uh, diagonally opposite Vodafone? Uh, yeah, I can answer that, Chair. Yeah, so the, the um, as Fraser um, alluded to, the, the, the quick history is that they currently lease 65 Argyle Street, which is a UTAS site, um, and that was as a result of a, um, a, a purchase of that land a few years ago, and, and, and the existing lease was, was part of that sale. Um, the university has aspirations to develop that site as part of the city move um, in the next two to three years. Um, and as a result, um, we've worked with Thrifty um, and the owner of the 290 Argyle Street site um, to relocate. Um, so the, Thrifty's idea is to be there for five years um, with a longer term view to either purchase or lease a longer term arrangement down the track. My understanding from the owner of that land is he intends to develop that site after that um, that five year period. Okay, so so the um, the university doesn't own this site that we're considering tonight. No, they don't. Um, just just in relation to um, we talked about you talked about the toilet um, uh, and stormwater being at the same end, but uh, it looks like the tea room and the accessible toilet um, is at the other end of, of the demountable. So I'm not quite sure why, why um, there has to be that sort of change. I think the, the plumbing um, lines up to where it's proposed. I think is how it works. And the, so the accessible toilet is just a staff toilet uh, by the looks of it, does there not have to be a, a public access uh, accessible toilet? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry, but I, I think it's um, like most businesses, you have a, a toilet there and it's basically used for all purposes, that one. Yeah, it's just, it looks like it's accessible through the tea room, so I'm not quite sure. Um, why that would be accessible for the for the public as well, unless I'm misreading where the door is in the plans. Um, in relation to the lighting at night, um, what sort of lighting, security lighting is, is proposed for this application? Well, um, we have spoken to Thrifty about it, and it's fairly minimal lighting. Um, I think it's important that whatever lighting there is, that, that it's uh, baffled and orientated to avoid glare to the neighbours, so um, very happy for a, a condition uh, to be applied along along those lines. Um, in, it's not to light the site up, it's just um, security lighting. Yeah, but uh, obviously, you know, the, the other uses around it might, uh, you know, might, might impact on those. So um, I... I mean, there's there's quite a number of the the <laughs> the things in this application that do uh, concern me. Um, so the um, the car movements. I mean, I've walked past that place when it's been a car yard and potentially rental, but it was a car yard. So the movements were very minimal. You know, if there were any movements whatsoever, it was a very jam packed site. Um, so I'm surprised that there, there is such a difference in, in um, you know, you were comparing it to 60 vehicles parked there previously, um, but the movements of cars was, was not that high. Um, so I'm concerned about that. Just in relation to the sign, Mr. Reid, could you just describe the signs? Because uh, I, I couldn't really um, 
see them in the plans? So there's there's two signs. One on the um, which is an illuminated light box on the fascia of the the new building, um, and the other is basically on the um, the flank wall. There's a, a painted sign there for refacing that. Is that in the application? Uh, I believe it is. Yeah. And what size are we looking at? Um, just a minute here. I'll have to look. Sorry, just bear with me a second. I'll get to you in a, in a moment, Alderman Brax. Yeah, it might take me a minute to find them. Mm. Uh, if I may help, the light box, yeah, the illuminated light box is 1.8 metres um, long. Um, and the other sign... Maybe, Miss Aby, you might be able to assist... Ms. Obi? I don't know whether it's dimensioned. I think it's the answer. I think we're just going to reface that existing painted sign. Look, ha happy to um, have a condition that's no larger than the existing painted extent or something. All right, thank you. And um, the, the application is, is kind of devoid of any landscaping. Um, would you... Would you be? Um, would you have any problems with having at least some sort of landscaping just to to reduce the impact from the street? Because sometimes it's quite good to try and improve the the uh, the overall aesthetic of a, an application. Um, just thinking how how we do that because we're not allowed to dig, <laughs> dig at all. So it would. Perhaps Mr. Noy could help us. Yeah, it'd have to be in pots probably, and I'm just not sure how practical it is for this short term. I, I understand what you're trying to say, though. Um, yes, uh, Chair. Well, it'd have to be in uh, planter boxes of some some sort. Um, and, yes, there is an ex existing sign on that wall, so you'd be rebranding that, Mr Reid. Yes, that's the intent. Mm. All right, any, thank you. Any further questions? Alderman Barakas, did you have something? No, Chair, I didn't have my hand up or anything. I'm all good. If there are no further questions, I thank you, Mr. Reid and um, Mr. Johnston. Um, and I'll open the item for discussion. Chair, I'm happy to um, move the recommendation. I don't, don't see too much else to say other than that um, what we have before us looks um, compliant and looks like it meets the provisions of the scheme. And um, I'm not I'm not sure about looking for condition or trying or putting for conditions for um, uh, uh, landscaping. It just doesn't seem like it would be necessary on a, a site with the zoning that it has, especially with the restrictions about um, digging into the ground or anything like that. So I'll. I'll um, I'm happy to move the item as recommended, and if there are any recommendations that are put forward we, for conditions, we can, we can discuss them as they go. Thank you. Alderman Briscoe. Uh, thank you, Chair. Look, uh, yes, I'll support the motion for approval, the officer's motion for approval moved by uh, Alderman Barakas. Um, I suppose, in a way, uh, this in, in the future would be an ideal site for residential development. Um, and, but there is hope there because uh, if this is a short-term five-year uh, project, then at the end of five years, we'll probably have approved the precinct plan and give incentives for developers to rezone, um, uh, possibly. So I think the officers have uh, got it right this time and uh, recommended for approval and I'll support that. Thank you for the discussion. Councillor Dutta. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. I, I was uh, uh, quite impressed with the condition that was suggested uh, with regards to opening hours. And I think that's a very reasonable way of looking at it. 
And the point that I've also taken on board uh, is that it is a light industrial. And therefore, unfortunately, I can't go along with some of the points that was made, even though I think they're valid, but it, it meets the provisions. Thank you. So, Mr. Noy, have you have you got um, conditions relating to? Um, I think uh, there was noise and um, trading hours. Uh, Chair, the, the trading hours are included within the um, officer recommendations. Uh, one relating to uh, trading hours of um, the use itself as a car hire uh, premises. And secondly, um, limitations on the car washing uh, component of, of the use um, to Mondays to Fridays, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., Saturday, Sunday, and any public holidays, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. That, that's the operating hours. In relation to noise, um, I think, Craig, you uh, may have some a, um, a suggested wording around uh, a, a condition relating to noise that uh, limits the uh, noise from the car washing to accord with the acceptable solution within the planning scheme for noise. Um, Can we share uh, the screen, Craig? I don't have that document, sorry. Uh, Could you read out the condition, the proposed con condition, please? Um, yeah, so I think, uh, Craig, it was emailed to you at 4.10 p.m., but I'll read it out. Noise emissions measured at the boundary of a residential zone must not exceed the following 55 dBA between the hours of 7 a.m. to uh, 7 p.m. And I think that that would effectively cover um, the operating hours of the car wash. And just in relation to landscaping, like, is there is there anything that can be done, Mr. Noy, in relation to that, which isn't too onerous? Well, it would be um, landscaping within um, pots um, or planters uh, above ground. Um, so that would uh, could be imposed uh, by way of condition but uh, that has not been recommended by the officers. I, I note that um, there quite, were quite a number of um, discretions and um, uh, reliance on performance criteria, uh, and um, it seemed like uh, landscaping <laughs> could have been an easy one. Oh, thanks, Craig, for putting that up. So there we have noise and landscaping. Um, so there are two conditions, if you'd like to have a look at those. I might just ask the applicant, uh, Mr. Reid, is there any particular problem with that second condition of landscaping? Uh, the only thing that varies me is what uh, I'm committing uh, the, the tenant to in terms of the cost of that, um, because it's not in the ground. It um, would have to be in planters um, with irrigation. Um, I just don't know what I'm committing them to there is my um, reluctance around that. Um, I could say that on that lighting one, very happy to accommodate the additional lighting condition about uh, orientation and baffling to avoid uh, glare and lights will be on the site on that point. Okay, so is the, uh, Alderman Barakas as the mover, are you happy with the lighting and noise uh, at least, if not the landscaping? Um, I'm happy with the lighting and noise ones for um, for sure. I'd be comfortable with the landscaping one if it was provided as advice and we we're encouraging the applicant to, to put forward some landscaping, but I think it's a bit, given the zoning, it's a bit too onerous of a condition. Perhaps we can do that as advice to the applicant then, Mr. Reid. Um, it's a, 
Okay. All right. Uh, could we um, take that uh, those uh, things down now? Thank you. And we're back to the normal screens. Okay. Is there any further discussion? I just might make a point. I think um, uh, even though this is in light industrial, um, I think uh, there there are a number of concerns that I have around this application. Um, you know whether it's actually uh, really enhancing this this particular part of of uh, a changing face of North Hobart um, is questionable, um, and um, I feel that it comes very short in um, some of the uh, suggested performance, not just not meeting performance criteria. Uh, it is a fact that there are on three sides of this application or on this site um, residences um, and it is adjacent to a residential area. So, um, you know, it just uh, does concern me that, that this may be um, uh, something that, that is really repeating um, a car wash is, you know, at 270 Argyle Street, it's only just down the road as well. So... Um, there's, there's uh, whether whether this is a, a real enhancement for the area is yet to be seen. So I'll put the motion with those uh, amendments. Um, those in favour, if you can raise your hands. And those against. So the motion is carried, and that decision is is the final decision. It, um, it we've run out of time for any anything, and it doesn't need to go to council anyway. Thank you. Thank you to the applicants. Thank We're going out much. to eight point one, which is uh, a patient, patient, Mr. Sibley and Dr. Jocelyn McPhee, um, it's a petition to rezone. 2121B and Enterprise, uh, Enterprise Road. And I believe, uh, Lord Mayor, you're here for this one as well. If you are and you want to participate, would you like to um, put your camera on, please? So I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Sibley, or uh, Mr. Sibley, are you going first? I'm going first, um, yeah. Deputy Jocelyn, Mayor, sorry. Jocelyn McPhee. Yeah. Okay, fire away. Thank you. Okay. Could I have the first slide projected, please? Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to the planner's report on the rezoning of land above Enterprise Road. What I want to do now is to remind you of the issues relevant to the zoning of this land as outlined in the planner's report. This view on the screen shows the three properties involved, 21, 21B and part of 21A Enterprise Road. As you can see, they lie on the northeastern slope of Mount Nelson, just down from Bicentennial Park. I draw your attention to three attributes of this land that are important in considering the zoning. The steep slope, the highly constrained access, which is highlighted by the red line, and being bushfire prone. All development on this land has to mitigate a bushfire attack level of flame zone. And the only way into it and out of it is via a narrow lane that connects to Enterprise Road, which is itself a no through road. Could I have the next slide, please? Given these attributes, why is this land zoned as general residential? In order to understand, we need to review the history of zone changes. In the 1982 Hobart planning scheme, the zoning was hills face in recognition of the steep topography, the constrained access and the sensitive landscape. Hills face meant minimal development was possible and only at the discretion of council. The zoning remained Hills Face until 10 years ago, but there were three occasions in between when the zoning was considered by the council, but didn't change. Two of these occasions, an unsuccessful amendment in 1999 and the Mount Nelson planning review in 2006, 
both proposed that development was possible, but recommended a dwelling density of one dwelling per 1500 square metres. The third occasion was the draft Hobart planning scheme in 2009. This scheme proposed a residential zone with a bushland values schedule overlay. And the schedule had implications for the dwelling density, the building style and how vegetation uh, was to be modified. The first change happened in 2011 with a successful amendment to the 1982 Hobart planning scheme. This amendment emerged from a request to develop land nearby at 40 Nicholas Drive. Council extended the investigation to include the land above Enterprise Road and two other hillside locations. So when the change happened, it was applied to all four. The amendment resulted in hill space becoming residential too, for which one dwelling per 750 metres squared was allowed on slopes steeper than about 12 degrees. And that dwelling density was simply inherited from the provisions in the 1982 planning scheme for development on steeply sloping land. When the 2015 Hobart interim planning scheme came in, all residential zones were converted to general residential, which allows one dwelling per 325 square metres, regardless of slope, access constraints or bushfire risk. So as you can see, consideration of the site's special characteristics was incre incrementally eliminated over these planning changes. Could I have the next slide, please? In any discussion of rezoning, it's appropriate to consider the zone application guidelines published by the Tasmanian Planning Commission. The guidelines for general residential zones are clear in advising that this zone should not be used for land that is highly constrained by hazards, such as those that arise from sloping steeply, having very constrained access and being bushfire prone. On the other hand, the guidelines for low density rent residential state that this zone should be applied to residential areas where there are environmental constraints that limit development. For example, land hazards, topography or slope, precisely the characteristics of the land under consideration. In conclusion, the case for rezoning is a very strong one and has been endorsed by the planner's report. As members of the City Planning Committee, you have an unparalleled opportunity to rectify this anomaly in zoning. And on behalf of the local community, I urge you to do so as a matter of priority. Thank you. Thank you, Dr McPhee, um, appreciate that. Now, do we have any questions uh, from committee at this stage? If not, uh, we'll go uh, directly to Mr Sibley, if you'd like to follow on. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And thank you for having us uh, to make these representations. Firstly, I would like to say that we greatly appreciate the Planning Committee and the full Council referring our peti petition to rezone 21, 21A and 21B Enterprise Road to the, uh, to the officers of the Council for review. We are also pleased to note that the Council Planners Report has recognised the merit of our proposal and that they have recommended to the Planning Committee that a full study be carried out to assess our rezoning proposal. However, we note with considerable concern that the report indicates that limited resources preclude pursuing this study at this time and that there will be considerable delay in carrying out the study. Such a delay is very concerning for us and I believe is not in the interest of any of the parties involved. We believe that the most expedient resolution of this issue will allow the local community, the developers and indeed the council to move forward to a position that is equitable for all. 
At least since 1982, council recognised that this land was unsuitable for development at anything more than low density because of the steep topography and the constrained road access. The intent of our rezoning is not to stop or block reasonable development, but to guide the developer back to a reasonable proposal, one that does not adversely impact on the local community and the city as a whole, given the topography and the access. A decision on whether or not to change the current zoning should be given the highest priority by council. The land is privately owned by a developer who is no doubt making new plans to develop these properties following his withdrawal from the latest tribunal. It is possible that these new plans will be consistent with low density development. However, chances are that they won't given the history of the May 2021 DA for 23 and two storey large dwellings on one block alone. Making a prompt decision to progress a re review of zoning will in the long ter term <coughs> save a great deal of ratepayers money, council staff time and effort, and indeed the developers time and money. The risks associated with delay are immense, but avoidable. The council planner's report makes it perfectly clear that resources are not available within the council to deal with the proposed rezoning in a timely fashion. The obvious alternative is to engage a consultant to progress further evaluation of the proposed rezoning. The immediate cost to council might appear to be a deterrent but in the long run, this cost will be far less than costs associated with future inappropriate development applications. Further, we note in the reality, this, the success of any future development application that is, is any denser than low density is highly unlikely. The DA submitted in May 2021 was refused by council on the grounds of traffic primarily related to constrained access and on road safety related to the adjacent Burn Garner Enterprise Road T-junction. A narrow steep lane between two existing houses is the only way in and out of this parcel of land. Under the existing general residential zoning, these three parcels of land could be developed to contain at least 70 dwellings, resulting in a 170% increase in the volume of traffic from Enterprise Road onto the hillside network, which is struggling to cope now. This scenario is clearly untenable, as has been identified in the council planners report that recommended refusal of the most recent DA for just 21B Enterprise Road based on traffic from just 20 new dwellings. Neither the steep topography, nor the constrained access, nor the hillside road network can be changed. Only the zoning can be changed. In conclusion, on behalf of the 208 petitioners, I request that the council commits to progressing the rezoning case as a matter of urgency. Given the lack of internal resources, I further request that council assigns funds to engage a consultant to prepare the analysis recommended by the council planners report. We ask the city planning committee to pass a resolution recommending that the council one, commit further to analysis of rezoning at the next step in the process, and two, make funds available to engage a consultant to undertake a full analysis of the rezoning proposal in a timely fashion. Thank you for allowing us to speak here. Thanks, Mr Sibley. Now, again, I'll ask the committee, do you have any questions or... Uh, Lord Mayor, you're here now. So, are there any questions? It looks like it's fairly straightforward to everybody. Then, uh, thanks. Thanks for your time. And 
And Mr. Noy or Ms. Aidy, would you like to uh, perhaps uh, add some points uh, now, now that I um, have opened the item for discussion? Uh, thank, thanks, Chair. Um, no, nothing uh, further to what um, the deputations have, have put, uh, Chair. Uh, I suppose the officers are in your hands. You've heard, uh, you've read the officers' position. We uh, believe that there may be uh, a case for this change. We, any uh, submission uh, to the Tasmanian Planning Commission would need to be based on sound uh, evidence, uh, and we'd need to gain that evidence and uh, have council fully consider it before we could uh, forward it on. As you know, we've got a, a um, fairly heavy uh, commitment in the uh, strategic planning area. Um, we are gaining additional resources. Those resources won't be necessarily uh, fully available to us until early next year. And um, so that's the dilemma uh, we have uh, uh, trying to administer the, this matter. Sure. Okay. Now we have a, a, a number of people on the list. So Councillor Nutter, um, the Lord Mayor, and then um, Alderman Briscoe. And Mr Sibley, would you mind just turning off your microphone, please? Uh, yeah. Okay. Councillor Nutter. Thank you, Chair. Just two questions. Firstly, um, the report says that uh, this is dependent on additional staffing. Now, my question is, uh, what sort of a staffing expenses are we uh, uh, taking into account in dollar terms, if it's uh, appropriate for, you know, uh, to be answered here or not? And secondly, uh, if it is deferred, as uh, the director has said, will that mean that this can start early next year? So it's deferment for this year, but it can pick up next year. Mr. Noy? Yeah, and Ms. Hogue might want to jump oh. in and uh, uh, um, comment, but um, yes, that that is that is my um, belief that we would have sufficient resources to progress this uh, in the new year. New financial year, I take it. Uh, no, that's new calendar year. Oh, okay, right. Okay, Ms. Hogg, did you want to add anything? And you have to just turn on your your camera if you can. Nothing to add. I do. Um, I'm just turning my camera on. Hold on. Uh, yes, Chair. Um, we have been through a process of um, appointing additional resources and um, we're expecting that we will have a new strategic planner uh, maybe shortly before Christmas. So uh, we should be able to get that resource to work on this or free up the existing resources to work on this early in the new year. That's what we're hoping. Does that cover your questions, Councillor uh, th Thank you, Chair. Th that sounds very promising. Thank you. Uh, Lord Mayor. Yes, thank you. Just a couple of questions. One is um, just how um, this could potentially be dealt with through the, the current process of finalising the... Um, local provision schedules uh, and whether that might, um, you know, if we just simply initiate, um, ag agree to initiate an amendment as part of the local provision schedules and it would be advertised and then any reporting would be, any advice and reports would presumably come into the consideration of this, uh, this, the planning commission. So I'm just wondering whether it, it, it might be beneficial for everyone involved, including our own resources for this to be just sort of, um, I guess, done a little bit more proactively that the planning committee decides that you will initiate this amendment. It'll be, um, and you'll prepare the, um, the evidence for the amendment process uh, as part of the part, you know, the, the final advertising and promotion of the uh, local provision schedules. 
So I probably um, need somebody to sort of clarify the yep. process. Mr Noe or Ms Hunt? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll go, um, Chair. Uh, so the, the options will be to either, uh, this could be looked at through the local provision schedule, but as Mr Noy said, we will need to, we will need the evidence either way, whether it's an amendment to the existing scheme or it, it actually uh, is brought forward through the planning commission process uh, when the local provision schedule is assessed. Um, I would expect that uh, when the, re the new person or, or um, Ms Crawford has a look at this in the new year, those, those options should be looked at at that stage to see uh, what the timing might be, whether it, it's going to be more efficient to bring it in in the interim scheme uh, or through the local provision schedule. It will depend on how long it looks like it will take for the local provision schedule to come in. Yeah, so I suppose just in addition to that, um, while you might go through the local provision schedule process, it may delay it, in effect, um, from being introduced um, more expeditiously through the current current scheme. So one, one needs to take that into account. Does that answer your question, Lord Mayor? Uh, it does just to though just to supplement if I can just in terms of um, just outlining the representor's ability to also put this forward uh, with their own evidence as part of the local provision schedule. Can you just outline whether that's that's something that's an option as well, Mr. Noy? Uh, look, I'd defer to Miss Hogue on that one. Um, that is an option for the representors to to um, at the petitioners to make a representation to the local provision schedule process. Uh, they would need to um, employ, oh, potentially they they could provide um, expert evidence as part of that, or they could seek the council to consider. Um, as I understand it. Um, Yes, uh, I think um, they may not have access to that expert evidence. So that's why we were going to look at it internally. Uh, but the, the, the other issue that the petitioners have raised is the need to get owner's consent. And likewise, um, like the council initiating the amendment to the interim scheme, they wouldn't need owner's consent to make that representation to the LPS process. I hope that clarifies. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Briscoe, then Councillor Harvey. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, when you talk about resources and, talk, and in the same light you call um, uh, referring to people, um, the um, petitioners did indicate uh, a, a process of a uh, the council obtaining the services of an external planner. Um, if that's possible first, as a first part of my question. Mr. Noy? Um, well, uh, we would need additional uh, funding to uh, accommodate that um, expenditure. Um, I Look, it's very difficult to uh, ascertain the uh, cost of such an exercise but um, um, you know it could be you know twenty or thirty thousand uh, dollars of uh, uh, expenditure um, associated with that task and and that is just a, a guess on my part uh, thank you mr noy um, in previous uh, iterations of our council uh, the director could always find twenty to thirty thousand but I understand the situation we're all in because of uh, our reduced revenue. Um, uh, in terms of uh, time, um, my understanding of the amendment processes that I've gone through in the past is that it is quite a lengthy process anyway, and whether the two months makes much difference, uh, two or three months, if it's the start of the calendar year next year, you can allocate people to the job. Um, would you like to comment on that statement that 
it is a fairly lengthy process anyway, and, and two months is not going to be make difference because the Planning Commission uh, probably wouldn't uh, be able to schedule it anyway. And then we have to go out to public consultation too, don't we, uh, on behalf of the Commission? Yeah, look, it, it is a, a six-month process uh, potentially uh, and most likely. So, um, uh, and uh, that's, you know, uh, taking into account it getting... Um, to to council um so we'll need to put together uh, as i said a um detailed case uh for the rezoning and and yeah once it gets into council then then council can certify it for public notification and uh, as a standard scheme amendment and then there's assessment of any uh, representations and ultimately determination by the uh, Tasmanian Planning Commission. So, yeah, it can take up to six months. Any further questions or comments, Alderman Briscoe? Uh, yes. Look, uh, I, I know we haven't got operational control over council. Uh, maybe 30 years ago, good councillors did. But, however, uh, it, uh, um, if we somehow indicate in the motion to support this uh, recommendation that we would like the, uh, the planning department to treat it with some, uh, not so much, I don't think we can use the word urgent, but uh, certainly a high priority if that's possible. So is it possible uh, just to have um, an advice to the officers uh, that the, the planning um, committee and hopefully council would say, look, we treat this as a matter of uh, some importance? Well, it hasn't been moved, so you might want to... Well, I'm happy to move it. Move the recommendation. The recommendation. And, but whether yeah. we just offer an extra uh, clause there in the recommendation that uh, the council considers this a matter or the planning committee considers this a matter of urgency. Uh, as, a, as a priority. As a priority, yes. Yeah. Perhaps yeah. when resources are available. Yes, of course. So obviously, yeah. it's going to be the resources. OK, thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Harvey. Thanks, Chair. Look, between you and um, Alderman Briscoe, you, you covered it there. I was going to move the recommendation and just add, um, as soon as resources to do so are available or immediately as resources to do so are available. So you've got it covered. Um, I think we can only do our best once the resources are available. I don't think we can push ahead now. Um, and it's been indicated that we will have additional resources around Christmas time. So I think that's you know, the earliest we can get cracking on this, but I do see the sense of urgency as described by the representors tonight. And I would like to get this resolved as soon as possible um, to provide some certainty for the local residents and also for the owner of, of this land. But I'm, I'm conf confident and comfortable with the recommendation. And if we add, as soon as resources to do so are available at the end, I'd be happy. Yep, thank you. Lord Mayor, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Yes, if I can. I just wanted to ask the planning committee whether, um, given the, the fairly um, clear indication from the council about the inappropriateness of the, the um, project that met the, the current zoning, uh, I just wonder whether the planning committee would consider saying a little bit more um, positively in, in your recommendation that uh, a report uh, providing the evidence to initiate a planning scheme amendment to rezone the land from residential to low des density residential be prepared um, because th that would actually give more certainty for the, the staff that what they're preparing is a report to initiate the planning scheme amendment, not to sort of give the pros and cons, which will be, um, you know, a, a more complex report, um, but that I guess the planning committee can provide that, um, that you know, that more definitive policy direction that, that um, you know, you are interested in initiating that planning scheme amendment and that that's you, what you're asking the report to provide the advice on on the you know that that uh, yeah. proposed amendment. So I'll just ask the mover, Alderman Briscoe, are you happy with those that sort of more proactive position uh, um, and wording? 
I, I well, whilst uh, um, emotionally, I think that's probably a good way to go. I think as a matter of process, we still have to have evidence, uh, and the evidence is clearly is going to come back that it's uh, well, presumably, will come back and saying the pros outweigh the cons, and and to initiate an amendment, it would be going against um, process because we haven't had a report about it. We've we've he heard some really good evidence from the petitioners. But I think, no, I, I, I'd be uncomfortable to include that uh, uh, because it's going to come back to us um, with the evidence and then the council will make a decision to proceed with an amendment and then go through the consultation all that. So, no, because of the process. It's not because I, I don't believe it should happen. It's because I think it's, uh, it's, um, it, it's not going through a proper process if we do it that way. It's not going to. It's not going to increase uh, the time. Oh, decrease the time. It's going to come before us. I'm sure. Mr. Noy, um, are you? Um, uh, there's quite a lot of information already gathered by uh, residents in this, um, um, and and certainly in the report and information from uh, Fraser Reid. Uh, would that help you and officers on the way to to formulating? Um, that sort of um, change? Yeah, look, I think, um, well, it's important to uh, garner all of the facts and what we're saying is that we just need um, more time to do that. Uh, this uh, will be tested uh, before uh, the TPC, uh, so it's uh, prudent uh, for us to, as I said, garner all of those uh, matters. As we've indicated on the face of it, it looks a fairly compelling uh, basis in which to act, but prudently we need to uh, gain all those uh, necessary details and and then provide those to you as the ultimate decision maker in which to proceed or not. Okay. All right. So, uh, Alderman Brackus, you have uh, a question? I, I, do have a, I do have a quick question. Um, the... I suppose it's definitely allowed. Is it typical to rezone individual um, uh, properties without the involvement of the owner of the property? I know it's I know it's allowed, but is that something that typically happens, Mr. Noy? Um, not not uh, necessarily typical. Not as a, a, a um, one-off uh, matter like this, um, site-specific um, matter like this, but. Given the um, history of this site, uh, it would appear that, as I indicated, as the officers indicated, there would appear to be some justification for it. Thank, thank you, Chair. Are we just doing questions, or are we sort of debating as well at the moment, Chair? Um, you can say whatever you like. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, I'm I'm a little bit torn because I, um, on one hand, the the idea of um, you know, rezoning property that belongs to somebody else after they've purchased the property that's obviously valued at or um, with, the, with the expectation that um, they'd be able to do something with that property, um, noting that what they did, what they put forward initially and previously, I was one of the ones that agreed that that was um, inappropriate. Um, and the rules of the day also agreed that they were inappropriate. At the same time, I think, um, like many of the other elected members, saw this a similar presentation was given to me one-on-one -on -one, uh, with similar information and they the um, petitioners representors um, do make some very very good points and perhaps the um, the area is mismatched as far as as far as the zoning and some of the points that they raise do point out that perhaps there definitely is some issues with how it's zoned um, so look I'll, I'll just once again this is this is one that I'm a little bit conflicted on but I'd be supporting it tonight, but I'd indicate that um, uh, this might this wouldn't be an indication that I'm necessarily going to go one way or another because I do I do appreciate the arguments for um, it does sit somewhat uncomfortable with me, but I, I do probably agree that this is a mismatch as far as the zoning. Uh, Chair, I think you're muted. Uh, Dr. McPhee, we don't usually have comments um, from. Oh, okay, no problem from um, representors uh, at this point, but um, this will go to full council anyway, okay. so you'll be able to have discussion. Councillor Data.
Thank you, Chair. I, I think Alderman uh, uh, Barakas makes a valid point uh, with regards to what he has said. Uh, on the contrary, my uh, clarification that I'm seeking is this, that this is uh, quite in order procedurally, uh, and we have the jurisdiction or the power, and we won't be in any way acting ultra-virus to what we propose to do. Can that be clarified, please? Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, it is uh, completely in order, uh, Chair, uh, provided you have the qualified advice in which to make a, a determination. Thank you for the clarification. Appreciate it. All right. If there's no further comments, I just want to say, look, um, I really appreciate the work that that um, this community group has has done. Uh, it's an amazing body of work, and it really helps um, with those presentations. Certainly, help clarify those changes over over many years and different schemes and so forth. Um, so uh, appreciate that. I think it's it's really good background work for for um, Mr Noy and his officers. I'm also heartened to think that this might occur in, in the calendar new year, which uh, it's not all that far away. Um, the points made tonight have been very clear that we, we do um, get tied up and there's a financial cost and um, certainly a, a, an employee cost in relation to to preparing things which which may be totally inappropriate um, for the type of site. And we certainly saw that in the last application. So my thanks for this discussion tonight. Uh, so I'll put the, the motion as moved by Alderman Briscoe. Um, is there any dissent? So that's carried unanimously and it will go to full council next Monday. Thank you very much for your time. Um, committee, uh, we have quite a number of officers here, and I just wonder if we uh, perhaps can continue on these reports. Um, so go to 8.2, uh, whilst we have all the officers here, which is the Central Hobart Precincts Plan discussion paper. Can I have somebody, is there any problem with going to that directly? No, okay, thank you. So um, perhaps we can hear from Ms Hogue again uh, in relation to this report or Mr Noy. Thank you. Uh, happy uh, for Ms Hogue to um, uh, introduce it, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so what you have before you is the discussion paper for the Central Hobart Precincts Plan. Um, this project has been running for about 18 months now and it unfortunately um, there was a pause to the project because of the uh, lockdowns last year. Uh, we thought there might have been a, another pause <laughs> shortly coming up, but we've got our fingers crossed. Um, so this, this discussion paper is designed to go to the community to generate some um, input into the draft precincts plan, which will be released in the oh, around about April next year. It um, puts forward a, a number of propositions about what uh, the centre of Hobart, um, an area of around 64 blocks, might look like in about 20 years' time. It is um, arranged in a framework that covers all the, the matters that need to be considered in a uh, strate strategic planning framework um, that also um, brings in urban design matters as well. And so it's based around five uh, city shaping goals and it um, proposes a number of ideas under each of those goals, plus some potential future directions. Um, the, yeah, so I might leave it there unless there are any specific questions. Yeah, and I think most of us were, were at uh, the briefing or would have had a briefing by now, but um, I'll open it to, to questions. Um, and obviously this is for a discussion paper to go out to, to the community. We'll start with you, Alderman Briscoe. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, congratulations to the officers. It's come up really well. It reads really well. I don't know whether I'll be around in 20 years' time to see when <laughs> some of those, those uh, plans come into fruition. Um, I, I won't say which photograph, but I thought, gee, we, someone's taken a photograph in my backyard. Perhaps I should have painted the fence before they climbed over the fence and took a photograph. <laughs> um, uh, I'll talk to the officers about how they managed to get that photograph. But uh, um, no, well done. And I, and I think uh, the, the public will be quite enthusiastic about this. So I, I don't normally say things like that. I usually am um, a bit more analytical about uh, report, but I think it come, it's come up well. I, I, I sense that it will get uh, community, good community engagement. So well done. Thank you. Further discussion? Did you want to move it, Alderman Briscoe? Yeah, I'm happy to move it. Um, uh, yeah, Thank happy you. to move it. Okay. Further discussion? If there's no further discussion, um, look, I, I agree with Alderman Briscoe. I think um, this is certainly um, a, a well, a very thoughtful uh, paper, uh, which uh, which pr will provide a platform for for many in the community to have their say um, and to imagine Hobart as as to how it might be. Uh, not just in 20 years' time, but over that period, how those underutilised areas of our city could be joined up a lot better uh, and could um, actually have many more people living there. So it's, um, thanks, thanks, Ms Hogue and crew. Um, I think this is a very exciting uh, part uh, of, of um, the, the work to be done. Mr Noy, what, the Hill PDA stuff, when, is, when do we get that back? Uh, that has been used. Um, I thought that that had been, uh, that's available on our website, Ms Hogue, is, um, I understand. Uh, um, Chair, the, uh, the original document that was prepared uh, about 18 months ago, um, prior to the previous consultation, is currently on the website. The COVID-19 update will be provided on the website with the discussion paper, along with a paper on developer contributions that has also been commissioned uh, this year as well. Thank you. Councillor Harvey. Thanks, Chair. Um, through you to the Director, I'm just scrolling through again um, to look at the, the, um, the strategy to engage on this item. Um, so I assume that there's a well-designed strategy. We always get caught, well, not caught out, but we always get criticised that um, people didn't know about it or they'd missed it. So are we sure that we've got the right strategy in place to be able to um, push this around the community so we can guarantee we do get good feedback? And we do engage a significant number of Hobartians in the process. Yeah, look, we have um, got an engagement uh, plan um, with with the proposal because we yeah, we do appreciate that um, this is a, a significant body of work, and we do want to engage uh, the wider community in in this process. We've got a launch proposed on the twenty sixth. We've got online survey. Um, uh, through uh, your Hobart your your say webpage, um, we've got a series of workshops. We've got three proposed. Um, we also, you will recall, we have a um, a steer. Um, well, we have a steering committee, but we also have a um, a consultative committee as well as part of the uh, as part of the brief. And we've uh, certainly engaged with those. We are going to have a cities talks as well about urban villages um, that we would like um, the current CEO to, to deliver later in November. Um, so we're all, um, I suppose, giving as much airtime as we can to this. And we've, and we've got a, a, um, a, a comms um, a firm engaged to assist us in this uh, exercise. So I think we've covered as many bases as we can. 
noting that you can uh, plan and manage this uh, as as uh, well as you can, but um, uh, are not always successful in your objectives. But... And can I just ask, have we included um, different generations, like school kids, university students, the elderly, in what they would like their grandkids to inherit because they might not see it, but and also what our school kids would like to see. Have, haven't we done exercises like that before? And is that going to be part of this exercise? So we get a multi-dimensional, yeah. yeah, multi-age group approach. Yeah. I'll hand that over to Miss Hogue, um, who's been engaged in this exercise. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair. Um, yes, we have. Uh, we've in our engagement strategy, we're looking at the broad range of um, stakeholders and the community. And, and as you can imagine, for this area, this, these 64 blocks there, there are thousands. <laughs> um, and, and it's the, bright, the wider um, Greater Hobart community as well. We are, are specifically looking at ways that we can engage young people. Um, we've, yeah, um, there's some workshops that are being held around that. Uh, we are tapping into uh, the community organisations that the city of Hobart has, a range of those, and and the um, invitation to the workshops will be very wide as well. Um, we're we're planning to letterbox all the um, owners and occupiers within the area, and our um, communications team are looking at ways that we can um, publicise this through the Mercury, for instance. Um, so we're hoping, um, as Mr Noy said, you, you never know, but we're trying to touch all bases. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Alderman Baraka. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and through you, thank you to all the staff for this body of work. It'll be very interesting to see um, where this goes and how this progresses. Just one question in regards to the consultation. I'm just jumping off what the, the questions that Councillor Harvey had. Um, in regards to the um, stakeholder consultation, um, you did mention some of the relevant organisations or groups that are formed through or underneath council, however we want to say that. Um, is there also any specific consultation happening with major stakeholders or peak body groups? I know if you're talking about community groups or talking about um, uh, groups such as master builders of the property council, those that um, uh, represent builders and, and, and infrastructure groups and such? Yes, uh, Chair, certainly the property council is part of our um, um, engagement um, group, um, along with TASCOS, uh, yeah. Architectural Institute, Planning Institute. Um, so uh, we, we wanted to make sure we, we covered all um peak industry uh entities in in this process so it's a good cross section of different groups to it, so make sure a, that that sort of peak section is is has their voice in this it's a fair cross section thank you very much Jack. okay if there's no further comment i'll put the motion as moved by alderman uh, briscoe is there any dissent no dissent that's passed unanimously now, committee, it is uh, just after seven o'clock. Do you want a break or can we just keep going? Who wants a break? Uh, keep going, I think. Yeah, I'm happy to push on unless you need a break. So we've got we've got two who do need a, a break. Uh, I'll be a third who needs a break. So um, just, just we'll be back to... <laughs> here at uh, seven seven ten uh, to resume. Thank you. Thank you.
For some reason, I can't turn on my video. I'll now fix I that. <laughs> yeah. right. I cut them off when you left just to fix the stream. So. No worry. All right, I think we've got everybody back. So thank you for um, your indulgence. Uh, we'll go now to um, 8.3, which is the Tasmanian Planning Policies feedback on, on the scoping paper. Um, Mr Noy, would you like to edit and make a few points? Sorry. Um, yes, Chair. Look, this is um, um, an initiative of the um, state government around, and in particular, the uh, Tasmania Planning Unit, um, about providing, I suppose, greater um, direction, policy direction um, under LUPA um, around major, uh, I suppose, uh, policy um, matters. Um, that affect the planning system. Um, a fairly uh, broad ranging policy um, initiatives that are proposed. And the, um, the Tasmanian Planning Unit has um, circulated a, a proposition as to what those uh, policies should include. We've sought officer feedback in relation to those um, suggestions and have um, outlined a, um, a number of uh, suggestions for uh, possible improvements uh, or additions uh, to those policies. Um, and that's uh, contained in uh, the attachment uh, to that item. So I am, I'm happy um, if um, Ms Hogue has got anything further to add uh, to, to that uh, introduction. Um. Uh, nothing um, further to add really um, apart from the fact that um, that we probably that there's one small oversight in the um, the report where we talk about affordable housing we should really refer to both affordable and social housing yeah, and I think, um, the, Mr Noy, you did um, make that comment to me or I think it was picked up by Ms Parker. So, yeah, right. more, than, more than happy to, to consider that. So um, thank you. So any uh, discussion? Have you got your hand up, Alderman Barakas? Right, Alderman Barakas. Yes, I do. Thank you, Chair. I think the, the white background of the window makes it a bit difficult. Um, just in regards to that last comment about affordable and social housing, um, just to confirm, you're proposing looking at treating them as two dis distinct and different things. Is that what you were su suggesting? Uh, through you, Chair, yes, they, they are different types of housing that, that um, and certainly say in the precincts plan, we've mentioned both. Yeah. as to separate types of housing. Yeah, good, because I think, I think that's important. They're different, different types of housing with different needs, different concerns and restraints and so on. So that's, I, think, I think that's important. Would you like to move it, Alderman Barakas? Sure. Uh, and presume, including with, with that. Uh, that yeah, 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 thank you. Okay, further discussion, thanks. Okay, I, I appreciate the um, the points that are made uh, and and the uh, inclusion of climate change response to climate change as well. So um, interesting that that's that's uh, up the the top of of um, uh, decision making or to be included. And I think all of the changes that you have suggested have been uh, quite good. So thank you for that. Any further discussion or? If not, I can, I'll put the motion with that um, amendment. Those in favour, if, is there any dissent? No dissent, so that's unanimous. Thank you very much. I think you're back on mute, Chair. Ah, sorry. 
Uh, monthly, so we'll go to 8.5. Oh, sorry, the sustaining sustainable building program, 8.4. Any comment, Mr. Noy? No? Okay, can I have somebody move that, please? Thanks, Councillor. Oh, Mr. Noy, did you have a comment? No, I was just saying, Mr. Steve, Stevenson's here. Um, been waiting patiently for this item, but uh, my, my look, my understanding is that there isn't any government uh, support for this, and we would require it to initiate the um, the initiative. So, and I understand that there will be um, other uh, alternative options being pursued by. Um, City Innovation uh, uh, to uh, look at this matter. Good, thank you, um, Councillor Harvey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Look, I've seen this come up now a few times, so it's good to see that the idea of promoting sustainable buildings, like it's always been on the agenda, but it's good to see that it's being highlighted a lot more now. I think... Um, uh, Mary Massena sensed that response to my question around to, to everybody, which indicated the, the high level of sustainable buildings that they're aiming for at the, um, um, the Macquarie Point site. And also the university has talked in depth about their desire to create really um, sustainable, high, you know, the uh, national standard high, you know, high level sustainable buildings in their developments and especially at the, um, you know, the, the site in Sandy Bay. So it's good to think that this is on the agenda because we will need to be really increasing the performance of buildings across the whole country in the decades to come as part of our, you know, national and even the global response to, um, to, to climate change. So the more we put it on the agenda and we keep talking about it and hopefully at some point in time there will be um, some really high level action plans to make sure that we are getting the best building outcomes in the city. Um, and that's, you know, commercial buildings and also um, residential developments as well. So I'm pleased to see that we talk about it and hopefully that'll lead to much stronger engagement and better outcomes in the future. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, is there anything that you wanted to add <laughs> since you've waited so patiently? Um, look, no, thank you very much, Chair. The, the, um, this has just been uh, on the on various agendas for a long time, and, and the Sustainable Hobart Action Plan has got um, uh, actions within it to to deal with with essentially the same questions. And so it seems more sensible to to deal with it there and, and just put this one uh, to bed, given that there's some uh, issues around state government that we can't necessarily follow through with with the. Um, with this uh, recommendation that's been sitting there since 2014. Do we know how how many um, like the the level of emissions through through building, um, which how, how that how much that contributes to our overall um, greenhouse gas emissions as a city? Um, look, it's quite high. I don't have that figure in front of me, but I can certainly come back to you with that uh, with that figure. Thank you. Uh, I just I just note that um, you know obviously reducing overall heat um, radiating from cities and um, that can be done through through innovative ways of of uh, building. Um, so it's not only in, just in the build, but it's how, you know, the green roofs and so forth. So if we're getting to that point where um, we're a little more sophisticated further down the track, I think we can really reduce our overall uh, heat uh, island effect as well. So if there's no further discussion, uh, the motion was moved by you, Councillor Harvey, is that right? Oh, Councillor Dutta. I'll put that. Is there any dissent? No dissent. Thank you. And that will go to Council on Monday. Um, 8.5. Thanks, Mr. Stevenson. 8.5 is mm -hmm. the monthly building stats. Can I have somebody move that, please? Alderman Barakas, thanks. Any dissent? No dissent. Uh, I'll put... Um, I'll 
that's carried. Uh, 8.6 is monthly planning statistics. Can I have somebody move that, please? Councillor Harvey, thank you. Any dissent with those figures? Uh, Chair, have we missed uh, one planning item? Yeah, we'll, we'll go back to that. I was just going right, through the reports. Yeah. Yep, oh, we've got yeah, two, yeah. I think. Uh, 8.7 is delegated decisions. Can I have somebody move that? Alderman Barakas, uh, any dissent? That's carried unanimously. 8.8 .8 is the advertising report. Is there anything of, of note, Ms Aby? Uh, yes, there are a couple of interesting ones on the second page. Uh, one is the redevelopment of the site adjacent to the King Street Butcher. So that's proposed for some commercial space on the ground floor and some dwellings above it. And also the um, development of a tram museum at the Regatta Ground site, um, which is a council project. Thank you. Can somebody move that, please? Councillor Coates, uh, thank you. Any dissent? No dissent, that's carried unanimously. And we'll now go um, back to the planning items as, as um, Alderman Briscoe suggested. So the first one is under the Sullivan's Cove planning scheme and it's 7.1.1 um, on page eight, which is uh, signage in Battery Point in Kennedy's Lane. I'm, I'm happy to move that one, Chair. Alder, Alderman Briscoe's moved that. Any discussion or questions of the officers? No discussion. Uh, is there any dissent? It's no dissent that's carried unanimously. Uh, and 7.2.2, which is 29 Athlean Avenue, two multiple dwellings, one existing, one new. So it's under the, the um, Hobart planning scheme. Is, um, can I have somebody move that, please? Councillor Coates, thank you. Is there any uh, discussion or questions of Mr Noy? Mr Noy, I've, I've got a couple of questions. So the conditions, um, well, it's relating to the driveway in the first instance. It's um, another steep driveway with some of these blocks, and I know, know this block. Um, so that, that's very steep through there. Is, uh, is the gradient suitable according to the engineers? Uh, yes, uh, through you, well, to you, Chair. Um, we believe it is um, um, acceptable to achieve the uh, necessary access um, requirements. And it, the driveway goes very close to the house, so so or the existing house. So um, I'm just wondering about the the width. Does it does it meet the width requirements all the way through? Yes, uh, I think it. Look, I'd, I'd need to just check the plans. Um, it certainly the width was not. Uh, yes, it does. I can uh, read the plans here. It shows it at three metres all the way through. If it gives you some comfort, uh, Chair, this matter has been reviewed by the Senior Development Engineer and he was satisfied that we didn't need to see further plans for the design of the driveway. I see. So um, the fact that it's it's virtually on the, the boundary, we um, I think there was a request to ensure that that was quite stable through there, uh, given the, the difference in height of the of uh, the two properties. Uh, yes, there, I mean there, it is a, a slightly unusual design, and there is a condition which which requires that the driveway is certified to have been built. In accordance with the approved documentation. And just in relation to um, private open space, um, there doesn't look like, given it's a fairly steep block and you can see the contours um, uh, on some of the, the plans, but um, what sort of uh, allocation of public uh, private open space is there? I'm just looking at the plans. There's uh, for the existing dwelling. It looks like 62 square meters of open space, and for the uh, proposed dwelling, it looks 
like if I'm reading it right, 69 square metres of private open space, in, uh, in addition to uh, the proposed deck. Mm, okay, it's a fairly narrow bit of open space, but um, yeah, it just looks like a bit of a compromise. Is there any further comments or or uh, questions? Um, and just uh, in relation to, to overshadowing and and uh, distance from other dwellings, so it's so I'm probably not looking at the right plan. But um, is is the distance? It's it's far enough away. Is it uh, in relation to other? properties um, for the second dwelling? Look, there is um, a, a slight discretion associated with the deck and the car parking, one of the car parking spaces, and we've included a condition relating to screening of both of those uh, locations to ensure privacy is, um, is uh, maximised within the uh, bounds of the scheme. Okay, all right. So I suppose some of those concerns that I've raised and uh, which are reflected in the representations um, are satisfied. I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this application, but um, uh, it is a decision for committee tonight. So uh, uh, is there any dissent to uh, the motion as moved by Councillor Coates, was it? Yeah, okay. Uh, any dissent? Notice it, uh, motion's carried unanimously. Uh, now we go to uh, item nine, which is the committee status report. Has somebody moved that? Gordon Briscoe, any dissent? No dissent, thank you, it's carried unanimously. Responses to questions without notice. Can I have somebody move those, please? Councillor Harvey, thank you. Uh, any dissent? No dissent, thank you. Item 11 is questions without notice. Do we have any questions without notice? All right. Um, so we'll go to item 12, which is the closed portion of the meeting. And I'll ask somebody to move that, please. Thanks, Alderman Briscoe. Uh, if there's no dissent, I'll close this uh, portion of the meeting.